Hello everyone. So uh, in this section I would like to talk about MOS capacitors small signal response. This fits in the context of us dealing with a MOS capacitor, sort of in the last section of the course where we're dealing with MOS devices. And the outline of this section is to give you a brief introduction and background, derive the small signal model and capacitances, and a, a large signal response towards the end of this section. All right. Just as a reminder, what we did in the previous section where we looked just at electrostatics, we had looked at this MOS device, and we've said that as you apply a, a voltage to the metal and pull up the Fermi level in the metal, we will be neglecting any band bending in the metal. We said that the charges that come from uh, this um, applied voltage and the imbalance, the dipole, are going to be sheet charges in the metal. And we see a band bending in the semiconductor that keeps um, the Fermi level flat. There is no current flow there. And you're accumulating um, electrons at that band edge. Okay? So, you have, uh, sorry, holes at the band edge, given that we have a P-doping. P okay? And we have electrons uh, piled up against the uh, uh, oxide interface on the left. So, this is accumulation of holes on the semiconductor side. And we will be looking at charges in the semiconductor side, and we will be stating that all the uh, either electrons or, or lack of electrons on the metal side can be compensated by this uh, den strong, big density of states in the metal. So, we will be worrying about things happening in the semiconductor in this lecture. All right, so as we apply a voltage in the other direction, uh, again, we pull down the Fermi level in the metal. We also, um, uh, relatively speaking, hold the Fermi level steady in the semiconductor, but we bend the bands, and we calculated this band bending in the last section. And what we have charge-wise is uh, we will have an accumulation of carriers in the metal, and we are exposing a depletion region of exposed acceptors which build negative charge that are immobile. And uh, as we apply a voltage further, past a particular threshold that we defined, we will be uh, not only exposing acceptors in the semiconductor, we're also starting to pile up electrons uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the semiconductor. Okay? So the electrons are mobile. Uh, they're adding to the charge that's uh, to the are the exposed acceptors, and they are exposed by the band bending in the semiconductor. So we have accumulation, depletion, and inversion. We briefly uh, discussed how um, uh, where these carriers come from. So certainly on the uh, accumulation side. Uh, it's majority carriers. The response is very fast. On the um, uh, depletion side, the electrons that are, um, uh, or the holes that are moving away from the interface are the majority carriers. So that response is very fast. And um, the electrons basically uh, come and go from the body contact, or the holes in this case. Now, if you're in uh, inversion, the holes can go into the uh, body contact, but the electrons that are being generated are um, uh, generated by um, a recombination generation, by a Shockley-Reed-Harl effect, or by traps. So that's thermal generation. And this, the response time for that is fast for the uh, majority carriers, and it is kind of slow for the generation via traps. And um, the two processes uh, labeled here in red can generate fast responses. And uh, the processes labeled in green where electrons are generated in the uh, semiconductor, at the semiconductor metal, uh, oxide interface, those are slower processes that are generated by uh, thermal excitation. Now, Let's put this all together in terms of views of charges again. So we have a uh, electron charge and a hole charge 
separated by some oxide. That is certainly a capacitor. So we will be calculating uh, capacitances in this um, uh, section here. And in the um, accumulation region, things are rather simple because really you have majority carriers piled up against the oxide throughout this section. We are assuming that there is no charges in the inside of the uh, oxide and there's no charge transport across the oxide. So there's no leakage and there's always a straight potential here, potential drop in the oxide. Now, if we are working in the other direction, uh, if we are in inversion, there is really uh, an interesting feature here that we have on the semiconductor side, we have the immobile acceptors that are distributed in space. And so they're not just one particular, uh, at one particular slice of the semiconductor of the capacitor, but they're distributed in space. And then we can add electrons in the inversion that are uh, sort of a cheat chart, but they can sheet charge. But as we discussed also in the last section, they have a finite width as well, a finite distribution uh, in spatial size, so to speak. And what we have here are effectively two capacitors that are in series. All right. And as you might remember from your basic circuit courses, if you put capacitors in series, you effectively reduce the overall capacitance. So in that regime, you can imagine that the capacitance will become lower than the regime of accumulation. And that is now here labeled as a variable capacitor CS, that's the semiconductor capacitance in this system where you have a central potential and that is the surface potential we discussed at length in the last section. So CS is going to depend on uh, uh, psi s, okay? So, uh, and in, in between, um, in this region here, uh, your capacitances will be slightly different as well, okay? So we have to build a capacitance model and what we're worried about in, a, in an AC a representation of a small signal capacitance is really um, where in space are we adding and subtracting charges. Okay, so just as a, a prequel, if you will, we know that in this region we're adding charge at the tail end here of this distribution, right? And if we're in inversion, uh, we're adding electrons here, uh, um, uh, the inversion electrons. We can also make the depletion region um, larger. So there's going to be a couple of effects coming together and we're going to try to treat those with a, a small signal capacitance model. All right, so let's string this together. We have a gate, we have an oxide, we have a semiconductor, we have effectively three circuit elements. There's a, um, and we're mostly worried about here, the junction capacitance. Um, as I started to allude, in the, uh, there will be a variation in the capacitance as a function of gate voltage. It's not a constant capacitance. Here in, uh, in accumulation, we are basically dropping charges across the oxide. So we're just recovering the oxide capacitance. And uh, sorry, and, and the junction capacitance is the oxide capacitance. Now, as we are going into depletion, we're starting to, to separate um, a charge spatially and the capacitance goes down. And at some point, if you do this at low frequency, the uh, minority carriers, the electrons are coming into play. And in, at low frequency, they can bring the charge close to the, uh, to the oxide again. So the capacitance rises. But, as I mentioned, those are slow processes to generate electrons uh, at the, at the uh, semiconductor oxide interface. So that will only follow at low frequencies. At higher frequencies, these electrons cannot follow the rapid uh, signal modulation and you can't generate electrons fast enough through traps. So then the capacitance just goes down and stays down. All right. 
So we basically are um, ignoring then the, the gate tunneling and the uh, uh, depletion capacitance here. Okay, so putting this together, let's derive a small signal junction capacitance expression. All right, in the last lecture, we had uh, uh, said that the total voltage needs to, the gate voltage that is applied across the system needs to add up to the oxide capacitance and the, the size S, the, the uh, potential in the semiconductor. Um, let's imagine that we have to eventually calculate the semiconductor charge and we know that the overall semiconductor charge will have to be balanced against the charge that is on the, sitting on the gate in the metal. So that's the equal and opposite of the uh, gate charge. And the oxide uh, charge is just the, the, the charge across the oxide like this with the capacitance. That's the oxide voltage that is dropping off. So now we're going to derive in a couple of lines, the differential capacitance of the, uh, of the overall gate capacitance, which we are after. Okay, the gate capacitance is the, um, or the overall charge in the gate uh, modulated by the gate voltage, which is equal and opposite to the semiconductor charge. And we don't have charge in the, in the oxide. And we're writing down now that uh, the potentials need to add up. And since we want to build this differential here, we can easily, however, differentiate uh, the inverse of this. We could differentiate this expression here, Vg against the uh, semiconductor charge, and differentiate that, and we retrieve one component, which is the oxide uh, capacitance, and then we have a more complicated term, d psi s, uh, d minus qs. And that is defined as the semiconductor capacitance, this term here, okay? All right, so we have now our series capacitances. And as noted before, the semiconductor capacitance here is some function of gate voltage. It is not a constant versus the oxide capacitance. It doesn't change with gate voltage. All right, so now how do we get to the semiconductor capacitance, which is the differential of the semiconductor charge versus the psi s that we have defined in the last section? Cs is not fixed, but we have calculated in the last section the dependence between the semiconductor charge and the surface potential. And it looked, uh, this curve looked like this, right? We had where the semiconductor charge here in, in the depletion region was going uh, roughly as the square root of psi s, and then it became an exponential term out here. So now we can use that knowledge to calculate the overall capacitance, and we will define a term that we will be needing later. Uh, so here is the m, it's a, called a body effect coefficient, and it's the uh, ratio between the semiconductor charge and the oxide charge plus one. It's not quite clear why this might be uh, important right now, but we can relate this uh, to the uh, various thicknesses in the system, okay? So if you look at this, the oxide capacitance, one over CO, will have a dependence on the ox uh, this, um, the oxide thickness, and the, sorry, I should have circled it the other way around. We'll have a relationship between these two guys, the oxide thickness and the um, dielectric constant in the oxide, and the inverse will have the semiconductor th uh, uh, dielectric constant and the effective uh, charge uh, width in the semiconductor, and that's this WT, okay? So WT depends on the applied voltage, and here's again the model, and uh, we can express the uh, surface potential psi s as a function now as a gate voltage, and we use this factor of m to make our life easier in a couple of cases where we have expressions that we're going to use later. Okay, so we can directly relate psi s to the gate voltage, and then we packing in a factor 
uh, which is the body coefficient effect. So we can directly relate it with the coefficient. And obviously this, this m must be also then dependent on the gate voltage. Because obviously this term wt is going to be dependent on the gate voltage. In practice, there's values from m between 1.1 and 1.4. So keep that roughly in mind. Okay. Where is this coming from again? Why is this variable? Well, you have uh, a, an addition of charges, differential charges, either for the inversion electrons or you have uh, differential charges due to the edges of the depletion region where you wiggle the potential there. So we need to account for both, both of those differential charge changes. Okay, so we have a, a, a capacitor model. Now let's uh, evaluate some of the expressions. That will be done in section uh, two, and I'll see you there. Thank you.